Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to read a telegram we just received. Final ballot tabulation shows Dragnet has won Michael Award for Best Radio and also for Best Television Mystery Program in 1952. 20,090 qualified members participated in nominations and final ballot. Congratulations and best wishes. Ed Bobley, President, Academy of Radio and Television Arts and Sciences. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A United States mail truck is held up and robbed. Twenty-two sacks of registered mail are taken. The holdup men escape. There's no lead to their identity. Your job? Get them. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Yes, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, August 4th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications, and it was 11.05 p.m. when I got to room 27A, the squad room. That's it. There wasn't anything else to do. When I had a gun pressed right up against the back of my head, I didn't dare make a move. All right, bud. Take it easy. Joe? Nothing yet. The broadcast and the APB are out on him. How are you feeling, Houston? Not bad. Still a little shaky. How about my partners, Frank and Adolph? Are they hurt bad? No, a couple of bad bumps in the head. They'll be all right by morning. Doctor's treating them now over at Georgia Street. Can we talk to them tonight? Doctor doesn't think it'd be a good idea. We can wait till morning. You look a little pale, Houston. You sure we can't get you something? No, no, I'll be all right. Still a little shaky, that's all. It's the worst scare I ever got in my life. Thought I was gone for sure. How about a glass of water? Yeah, yeah, okay, if you got it. You bet. You got a penny, Frank? Yeah. Okay. Just talking about the getaway car when you came in, Joe. Yeah. But Houston here is pretty sure he was right the first time. It was a dark blue sedan, late model. Mm-hmm. Any idea at all what make it was, bud? I wouldn't like to say definitely. I don't want to mix you up. I got half an idea it was a GM car, maybe a Buick or an Olds. I can't say for sure, though. Well, here's your water. Oh. Huh. You didn't get a look at the license, huh? You sure of that, are you? No, I didn't see it at all. The whole thing went too fast for me. Uh-huh. I appreciate this. I got it. <sighs> Robbery, Smith. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, Inspector. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, we'll be here for a while. Yeah, 27A. Right, thank you. Goodbye. What you got? Post Inspector Joe. He's on his way over now. That's fine. Hey, Bud, when you started your run with that mail truck tonight, you have any inkling at all that there was something wrong? I don't think I got you, Sergeant. What do you mean? Well, I mean, did you happen to notice anyone suspicious hanging around the post office out by the loading platform, maybe? Something? No, 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 buddy. How about on your way to the Union Station? You notice any cars following your mail truck? There? No, if they were, I think I'd have noticed it. I usually keep an eye out when we're making a run. It's a habit I got into, I guess. How long have you been driving a mail truck, bud? About five years. I've only been handling the registered mail the last couple of months, so. Did your truck leave the post office on schedule tonight? Yeah, right on the dot. We followed the other trucks out. You see, the trucks that pick up the ordinary mail, they leave first, and then our truck leaves right after them. We only handle registered stuff. I see. The same routine tonight, no different. And you're the driver of the truck, that right, bud? Yeah, that's all I do is drive. Frank's the clerk, Adolph's the guard. That's regulations. On trucks that handle just the straight mail, the driver's the only one aboard. Registered mail trucks got to have three men, the driver, the clerk, and the guard. Oh, we know. 
We usually drive the same route from the post office to the Union Station. Yeah, you? we go the same way every night, straight down Temple Street, turn right and go down Ferguson to Alameda, then over Alameda to Union Station, make the pickup or the delivery, and then we come back the same way to the post office. And that's the route you followed tonight, though? Yes, sir, that's it. Well, we didn't make it back this time. I'd like to make sure we got this straight now, bud. Do you mind checking us out on exactly what happened from the time you got to the Union Station? No, no, I don't mind. I'll try to relax if you can. Just take your time. Try to remember everything, will you? Say, would you mind very much if I called my wife first? I know I'm going to be late getting home. I don't want her to worry. You bet. Go right ahead, bud. What's your number? I'll dial it. Oh, thanks. It's pleasant. 29321. Okay. You got a family, bud? Yeah, three kids. Mother-in-law, too. She lives with us. Here you are, bud. Oh, thanks. Lorraine? Oh, hi, Mother. Did I get you out of bed? No, nothing's wrong. I just called to say I'd be a little late tonight. I didn't want Lorraine to worry. No, please. No, I'm not in a bar. Why do you have to say things like that? If that's the way you feel all right, just tell Lorraine, will you? That... Hello? Mother in law, can never get off your back. I'm sorry to interrupt, Officer. It's all right, bud. You want to go ahead now? Let's see. You wanted to know what happened after we left Union Station? Yeah, that's right. What time was it when you left the station? Right after we loaded the mail sacks on the truck, 28 sacks, all registered, and took off. What time was that? Scheduled time, 9.56. Left the station, headed for the P.O., drove the same route along Alameda to Ferguson, then up to Ferguson. As soon as I turned the corner, I picked up their headlights in the rearview mirror, and they started crowding us. I knew something was wrong. Too late to do anything. I... They pulled up alongside, forced you into the curb. Yeah, it? the darkest part of the street, too. It was a big sedan, I know that. A four-door job, dark blue, and it was a late model, I'm sure. You notice anything special about the car, bud? I mean, maybe a dead fender, some special accessories on it, anything like that? No, no, nothing I'd be sure about. I was too busy trying to keep going, get out of their way. I didn't have much of a chance. They forced us up on the sidewalk. I saw a telephone pole coming at me. I had to stop. What happened then? I threw a bright spotlight on it. Blinded me for a minute. These three men got out of the car and came at us, guns in their hands. It all happened in a couple of seconds. I was never so scared in my life. Did you get a good look at any of the men? No, I didn't. It was pretty dark. The place they stopped us at. I couldn't be sure I'd recognize any of them if I saw them again. Well, what'd the men do when they came up to the truck? They put their guns in our face, made us get out of the truck and climb into their car, the blue sedan. And one of them got in the mail truck behind the wheel. His name was Sid. I heard that. One of the men said, follow us in the truck, Sid. You know where to go. That's that's what he said. And you happen to hear any other names? No, that was the only one. And Sid seemed to be the boss. He was giving the orders anyway. They put you and your two partners in the back seat of their car? Yeah, yeah, and the two thieves were in the front seat. One drove and the other held a gun on us. He kept the lower part of his face covered with a handkerchief. You could see the mail truck following a little ways behind us. Mm -hmm. They drove you straight down Alameda, is that right? Yes, sir. Like I told you before, I think it was about a mile, a mile and a half. And they turned off right into that alley by the warehouse, same place you found it. Uh -huh. I figured that was the end. Got us out of the car, Frank and me and Adolph. They just line up against the brick wall there, hands up in the air, facing the wall, and then they opened up the back of the truck and transferred the mail sacks to their car. Well, any conversation while all this was going on? Not too much, no. You see, one of them, I think that was Sid, he covered us with a gun, a shotgun. The other two moved the mail sacks from the truck to the car, and every once in a while the Sid would tell him, come on faster, we're short on time. I think that's what he said. Well, why'd they slug your two partners, this Frank and Adolph? Any reason for that? It's coming to that. You see, when they got all the mail sacks in their car and they were ready to pull out, the other two guys came over to Sid and one of them said, what are we waiting for? Let's kill them and get out of here. Yeah. And right away, our clerk, Frank, he began pleading with him not to kill us. I guess Frank was thinking of his wife and his little kid. Mm -hmm. How'd the thieves react? Well, they slugged him, cracked him with a gun and uh, hit him a couple of times. Frank went down. He started crying. Just a young kid. You know. Yeah, we know. Well, this other guy told Sid again. He said, come on, let's kill him. Let's get out of here. He's the one who had something wrong with his voice. It was real husky, you know, like he had a cold. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Well, I got to say, this Sid wasn't much for killing us. He told the other guy he didn't think they ought to kill us because they'd set him up for a murder rap besides mail robbery. The other two guys told Sid, what's the difference? If we're going to rob the mails, we might as well go all the way. And they argued about it a minute or so. Yeah. And then my other partner, Adolph, he began to plead with him. He said, please don't kill us. I sick to my stomach. I couldn't even talk. What did you say? I said I was sick to my stomach. I couldn't even oh. talk. Was that when they slugged it off? Yeah. Yeah, this Sid slugged him. He hit him worse than he did Frank. He kept beating him and beating him. I still hear it. I just got sick. I'll well, make a long story short. This Sid finally said, we'll give him a gambler's chance. We'll toss for it. Huh? That's just what he said. He said, we'll toss for it. And he says, hey, you. And he motioned to me. He said, I'm going to toss a coin. You call it. If you lose, we kill the three of you. If you win, we don't. Oh. So help me, it's the truth. 
I didn't know what to do. I tried to talk them out of it. Yeah. They wouldn't listen. The Sid told me either I called it or they'd kill us then. Took a coin out of his pocket and flipped it in the air. I called ahead. Guess I don't have to tell you. I won. Something new for the book. How'd it go after that, bud? He tied up the three of us and drove off in their car. About 15 minutes later that night, watchman found us and called you, fellas. You know the rest. And you're sure you wouldn't be able to identify any of the holdup men if you saw him again? No. Real sure? No. The General Bill, that's the only thing I'm sure of. This fellow Sid was tall on the thin side, about 45, 50 years old. The other two were fairly short, stocky. Like I told you, that one fellow's voice, deep and husky, I think I'd know him if I heard him talk again. Excuse me a minute. Robbie, Friday. Yeah, Walt. How's it going? Uh-huh. Yeah, not much doubt. All right. Fine. Yeah, fine. The getaway car, they just found it. Where'd you? Up in the Legion Park, just off Riverside. What about the mail sacks? They find them, too? Yeah, every one of them. Empty. <laughs> According to the report we've received, the getaway car was found parked in a clump of shrubbery on the edge of Elysian Park, about half a mile from Riverside Drive. All of the 28 registered mail sacks were found scattered in and around the car, and with the exception of a few pieces of mail, the sacks were empty. A crew from the crime lab was dispatched immediately to the scene to check the car and the mail sacks for fingerprints and to cover the entire area for physical evidence. The mail truck was also gone over for prints at the point where it had been located. The officers at the scene, Sergeants Bitteroff and Gonzalez, continued the investigation on their end. 11.50 p.m. After the inspector from the post office department arrived, we continued our interview with Bud Houston, one of the three victims of the mail truck robbery. We ended the interview a few minutes after midnight, and Houston was driven to his home. The following morning, along with the postal inspector, Frank Smith and I talked to the other two victims, the clerk and the guard, who were with Houston at the time of the holdup. They could add nothing to what their partner had already told us. The investigation went on. Every possible angle was checked and rechecked. Three days passed. Nothing. Thursday, August 7th, 5.40 p.m. Hi, Joe. How'd you make up? Oh, it's sour. Nothing at all. The guy wasn't even in town the night of the holdup, and he can prove it. You have any luck? No better than yours. I might just as well have taken the day off for all the good we did. Nothing from the stats office, huh? No. Last one we asked for won't be ready till tomorrow. It's getting a little embarrassing, Joe. We got them checking practically every robbery card they've got. MO description, only a few of them come close. We've already ruled them out as possible. The one you just checked on, that was the last. Yeah, about does it. Might as well close up shop for the day, huh? You ready? Yeah, let's go. All right. I'll sign us out. All right. Okay, Joe. Now that mail truck driver Houston, he and his partners were in checking through our mug books again this afternoon. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Did they come up with anything? Well, they spotted one mug shop, Crowley from Quentin, only a partial eye dent. Three of them couldn't even agree on that. I checked on the man. He's back in Quentin for a month. I can't say the three of them are cooperative. They've sure been working for us, haven't they? Hey, Joe, you in a hurry? How about washing up? Yeah, all right. Been a long time since we've had one start as slow as this one. You're really the worst, Frank. Oh, I mean right from the start, Joe. We find a getaway car, plenty of prints on it. You can't get a make on any of them. Yeah, no. Find out the car was stolen, we check the owner, location, leads nowhere. Prints on the steering wheel of the mail truck, parts of the mail sack, still no me. How tough can it get? Well, they might have something when their kickback comes through from Washington. The holdup men weren't amateurs, we know that. Joe, you check with Gonzalez and bid her off today. I didn't see him. Yeah, they're not doing much better than the rest of us. They got an informant hot on the thing. He's supposed to have some work for him tomorrow and a couple of possible. Say, how about the money taken from the mail they got? Listed the serial numbers on the bills going out to everybody? Yeah, a revised list went out late last night. Copy sent all over the country. Ray? Yeah, Mac, we're here. Call for the squad and system. Okay, thanks. Be right there. Okay, let's go. All right. Hope this call means something, Joe. Wouldn't mind going late tonight. What do you mean? My sister in law, Florence. She's having me and the wife over for dinner, some kind of fancy pork dish. Well, what's the matter with that? She never cooks anything until it's done. She likes things raw. Is that so? Imagine what that roast pork's going to be like. We'll all end up with trichinosis. Yeah. Go ahead. Mac? Which one, Mac? One, two, Joe. Thank you. Friday talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah, John. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, check. Okay, fine. About 20 minutes. 20 minutes, yeah. Right, thank you. Anything, Joe? Wilshire detectives, they got a petty theft suspect out there now named Cecil Grant. Picked him up this morning. What about him? Well, he had a $20 bill on him stuffed down in the corner of his pocket. Yeah? They checked out the serial number. It's on the list. 
6.05 p.m., Frank and I got in the car and drove out to Wilshire Station, where we double-checked the serial numbers on the $20 bill taken from the petty theft suspect Cecil Grant. It checked out. The officers at Wilshire Division had already made a run on Grant through R&I, but outside of one other arrest for petty theft, he had no further criminal record. His fingerprints had been checked, but they failed to tie in. The suspect was taken from his cell to the interrogation room, where Bill and I questioned him. He talked a lot, but he didn't say much. Well, now, look, there ain't any reason to get mad. We can settle this thing without a big rhubarb. No reason to get mad. 28 sacks of U.S. mail, mister. A couple of men slugged till they couldn't stand up. We figure that's a good reason. All right, all right. I know. Why, why bring your troubles in me? That wasn't enough. You got a piece of the loot, a $20 bill. You had it in your pocket. You admit it's yours. All right, so what? The holdup's still fresh. It ties you in close, Cecil. You're warm enough for us. What do you mean? What are you getting at? You don't need me to explain it. You got a piece of the loot. You say the bill must have been in your pocket for at least a day. That's right. Then it's a good chance you were in contact with the thieves. Either that or you're one of them. I'm not. You know that. Couldn't have been there. I got an alibi. Now, face it, Grant. You're not going to alibi that $20 bill. Now, how about it? I don't know. I told you I don't know. If it's not your job, you better check us out, Cecil. Robbing the U.S. mail. I think you know what that gets you. I don't know. Money was in my pocket. I just don't know. 25 years, 30, maybe 35. If you're not in, why fool with it? How about it, Cecil? I'm not in. You know that. Then what about the 20? What about it? Well, this is the way it happened. Guy owed me a 20. Owed it to me for six months, maybe more. Tuesday came around, paid off. Gave me that bill you got. This last Tuesday? That's right. Thought it was funny, but he's a nice guy. I didn't want to make trouble. How do you mean? Well, when he paid me the 20 back, he said, uh, well, look, here, Bill isn't phony, but... Don't let it out for a couple of days. Bill's okay, but just sit on it. Maybe a week or two. That's just what he told me. Who was it? Where did we find him? Well, he's a nice guy, a friend. I don't want to make trouble. It's already made. Now, what about it? Johnny Carter, 380 Nashville Avenue, apartment 2. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Because of its quality, Fatima is the one king-size cigarette that stands up. Here's the practical way to prove that yourself. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs. 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos, more and more smokers coast-to-coast are switching to Fatima every day. Buy Fatima. Your money back plus postage. If you're not convinced, Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking. Just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas by August 1st, 1952. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Add to your smoking enjoyment. Smoke king-size Fatima. Extra mild and soothing. Plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Get Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. August 7th, Thursday, 6.55 p.m. We called R&I, but they had no make on the name John Carter. My partner, Frank Smith, and I left Wilshire Division and headed out to check on the address given us by the theft suspect, Cecil Grant. The 300 block on Nashville Avenue was in West Hollywood, just below Melrose. Number 380 was an aging two-story apartment house. The architecture was old Spanish, a relic of the mid-twenties. The name John Carter appeared on one of the mailboxes, but when we rang, there was no answer. We contacted the apartment manager, and he told us John Carter worked at night at a downtown garage. Along with the manager, we went up to the second floor and checked through the suspect's apartment. We found nothing to indicate that he'd taken part in the mail holdup. After a routine interview with the manager, we got the name and address of the garage where Carter was employed, and we left. 8.23 8.23 p.m., we pulled up and parked half a block away from Carter's place of employment, an all-night service garage on South Figueroa. Frank waited in the car, and I headed up the block alone toward the garage. In the event Carter was one of the mail truck holdup men, there was a possibility his two Confederates might be employed at the same place he was. If this was the case, we didn't want to tip him off. Hi. Yeah. You want something? Yeah, I do. I need a little help if you got the time. 
I don't know. I'm busy right now. What's the matter? I got my car stalled down the street here. I can't figure out what's wrong. A lousy thing just stopped on me. All right. Check the gas tank. Yeah, nothing as simple as that. I got almost a full tank. Uh... Well, I hate to bother you. You think you could come down and take a look at it? It's not far, just a half a block down the street. Well, I'm pretty busy. You can see that. I don't know. Sure appreciate it if you give it a look. I'm not much of a mechanic myself. Probably something real small. My car's almost new. I don't know. Just a minute. All right. That's going to have to do. It's two and a half service charge. I have to leave the garage. I guess you know that. Okay, that's all right with me. i got to get that car started. You pay in advance. We've had too many hassles on this before. Okay. There you go. Yeah, okay. Just down the street, you said? Yeah, down this way. Okay. I don't know what happened to the lousy thing. It just quit on me. Ah. Uh, nice night. What'd you do, pound on a gas pedal, flood the carburetor? No, I don't think so. I kept trying the starter when the thing quit on me. There's an automatic choke on the car, though. Maybe that had flooded. I don't know. A half a block now. Which one's your car? Straight ahead there, the gray sedan. Oh, uh... This one right here. Okay, you got the hood open. Well, never mind that, mister. Just get in the car. All right, Frank. Oh, what's this? Police officer, this is identification. Get in the car. What's the matter? What is it? Come on, come on, in the car. Hey, what's the pitch? What's it all about? Your name, John Carter, address 380 Nashville Avenue. I don't know what you're talking about. Is that your name and address? All right, it is. What about it? Get him behind you. Help him, Frank. Yeah. All right, that's good. What are you trying to pull? What's this about? The U.S. mail robbery, Carter. I want to talk to you downtown. I don't know anything about any mail robbery. What are you talking about? Nothing to worry over. If you're cleared, you'll be back on the job in an hour. Well, why pick me? I'll work at garage. It's my bread and butter. Why don't you go ahead and arrest the newsboy down the corner? Same thing. No, there's a big difference. Yeah, Mr. you name it. A $20 bill. 9.05 p.m. After checking with the garage manager to make sure none of his employees were possible accomplices of Carter's, we drove the suspect back to the city hall took him to the interrogation room and started to question him. In the space of an hour and a half, he gave us three alibis, supposedly accounting for his whereabouts the night of the mail truck robbery. In the same period of time, we checked out each of the three alibis by phone call. Every one of them was alive. The questioning went on. 11.30, midnight, 12.30 a.m. We set out for coffee. 1 a.m., 1.30. We stayed on it. 2 o'clock, 2.30, 3 a.m. It was like any other interrogation. It's a lot tougher to keep asking the questions than to answer them. We were as tired as the suspect, but he had one big advantage. We had to keep pressing, and we couldn't afford to show our fatigue. All he had to do was to say no and refuse to answer the question. At a few minutes before 5 a.m., we called a halt to the interrogation, but not before we gained a point. Apparently, by a slip of the tongue, Carter gave us the name of the girl he was keeping company with and also her place of employment. After we booked Carter on suspicion of 211 PC, and after we picked up two hours sleep, we located the girlfriend a Grace Nelson at her place of employment, a telegraph office at Alpine and South Flower. All I know is I met John about three months ago. His family's from Cedar Rapids, same as mine. There's nothing wrong with John I know of. You know any of his friends, Miss Nelson, any of the people he has dealings with? Not personally, I don't. I heard him talk about some, though. Why, what's the matter? Do you remember any of the names, Miss Nelson? Let's see. He's always talking about Sid. I don't know his last mm -hmm. name, though. Don't know where you'd find him. And then there's Sammy. I don't remember his last name, either. I met Sammy once, but... I don't know where he stays. You notice anything unusual about Mr. Carter the last week or so, ma'am? I mean, anything peculiar, anything out of the ordinary? Anything peculiar? No, I don't think so. John's been just as nice as ever to me. I like him very much. Matter of fact, he's been nicer than he's ever been. How do you mean, miss? Well, for my birthday, I mean, last Wednesday. Yeah. Well, he was so sweet about it. I mean, really sweet. He gave me $400. Gave it to me in cash. He told me to go out and buy what I wanted. Wouldn't you say that's sweet? Have you any of that money left, Miss Nelson? Why, yes, of course I have. See, right here in my purse. See, right, right there. More than half of it. Carter, tell you where he got this money, Miss Nelson. Gambling game. He said he wanted the cards. What's wrong? Serial numbers, ma'am. This money was taken in a holdup, U.S. mail. We've got a pretty good reason to suspect Carter. You mean John's a thief? That's how he got the money? I can't believe it. Right, it's true, ma'am. So hard to believe. Uh -huh. I hope you don't think I had anything to do with it. I mean, robbing people, nails. <laughs> Are you sure it's John Carter you want? Yes, ma'am, we're pretty sure. We understand you were pretty close to him. He said the two of you were going to get married. I don't know. We did have it said at one time, but now I don't know. I mean, I have people in this town, my whole family. I couldn't let this get out now. You're willing to admit the $400 you got came from John Carter, the same bills that he gave him to you? I don't know. I love John. I want to hurt him. I really love him. 
tell me that you what's going to happen. Well, he's going to be charged with robbery, ma'am, holding up a U.S. mail truck, taking 28 sacks of registered mail. John? John Carter? That's right, him and two others. I'd like to ask you one more question, miss. Do you have any idea what Carter was up to? The robbery, I mean? Me? Of course not. No idea at all. I love John. I love him for what I thought he was. Go through anything for him, I love him. Just wouldn't make any sense, though, would it? Ma'am? Going to jail for him. Just common sense. You can't love anybody that much. That afternoon, we had the suspect, John Carter, brought from his cell to the interrogation room where he was confronted with the testimony of both Cecil Grant and Grace Nelson, two of the people he'd given some of the stolen money to. Another hour of interrogation and Carter broke. He admitted taking part in the holdup and gave us the name of his partner. He named as the leader and mastermind of the robbery a Sidney Grover at an address in Highland Park. Frank and I checked it out. Yeah. Police officers, you Sidney Grover? Yeah. I'm not feeling so well. Can't you come back later? I'm not feeling well at all. It's kind of important, Grover. I'd like to talk to you downtown. Come back later, huh? A little later on. I got so many troubles right now. Please. I'd like to talk to you about a holdup, Grover. A mail truck? We got the two men who worked it for you. They gave us the whole story. Two men? What do you mean? Can't you see I got trouble? Please don't bother me. Come back later, huh? Bad trouble. You better get your coat, Grover. Got to talk to you downtown. Look, don't you understand? My son's left me. My only boy. Packed his bag. He walked out. He left me. Ray, that's your problem, mister. He said he didn't want any part of me. He had an argument. He didn't like what I was doing. Big argument. He slapped my face. My own boy. And he walked out. Slapped my face. All right, you want to get your coat? Yeah, okay. Mail job, is that it? Got the other two? Yeah, we got them. All right, no argument. I didn't try to run away. I guess you can see that. My boy said it was a crook. We argued. He slapped me. Walked out. How come, Sergeant? I wouldn't know. Let's go, Grover. A sour story, huh? Old man trying a mail robbery. I'm 55. I don't look it, do I? Kid slapped my face. He said I was a crook. I couldn't hit him back. My only boy. Wish he hadn't called me a crook. Pretty sour story, isn't it? Yeah, it's sour. Let's go. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 29th, trial was held in Superior Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Feynman. Friends, there's one thing I'd like you to remember the next time you buy cigarettes. Fatimas give you more for your money. That's because no other king-size cigarette can match Fatima quality. And because Fatima is 21% longer than standard cigarette size. That added length means that Fatima's extra mild and soothing smoke is cooled and filtered for your protection. Get a pack tomorrow and compare them with the cigarettes you've been smoking. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. <laughs> Sidney Allen Grover, along with his two accomplices, John Harold Carter and Samuel Maxwell Johnson, were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, one count, and assault with a deadly weapon, one count. All three are serving their terms in the state penitentiary. First degree robbery is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. Assault with a deadly weapon is punishable by imprisonment for not less than one, nor more than ten years. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Herb Ellis, Dick Perrin, Inga Hollis. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, it's Counter Spy on NBC.